right. Let's see. Uh, good morning to everybody. It's good to see you all here. In spite of the heat, everyone has managed to make it out. We're so grateful. Uh, what a wonderful time together worshiping the Lord. Amen? Amen. Isn't it great to have such a good God that just any time spontaneous worship and praise breaks out, we are, we are so good. We are so blessed. We are so uh, grateful to our, our Savior. Um, while you're opening your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, uh, I just want to welcome everyone who's here for the first time. We've got uh, several guests with us this morning, so we uh, trust that your time with us will be sweet and that our uh, fellowship together will be encouraging and edifying and that we will leave this place a little closer in our walk with Jesus than when we arrived. Amen? God can do that. So, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 19. Um, so, I know we just sat down, but I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. We read there, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the first century church in the city of Ephesus, but we know and we believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning through His Word. And so we, we read, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and the length, and the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Father, we are so grateful for this passage of Scripture. But we're so grateful that this morning we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ with the expectation that through your Holy Spirit, you're going to speak into our lives. Lord, we invite you this morning. Lord, to do whatever you need to do in each of us to make us into the men and women that you have called us to be, to make us into the church that the world needs us to be. Lord, whether that requires rebuking, correcting, discipline, whether it's just a matter of exhortation, encouragement, Lord, whether it's a matter of being equipped, God, we're looking to you this morning to accomplish all of that in each of our lives as only you can do. And so, Father, we submit ourselves to that work of your Holy Spirit and pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear. We trust you for this and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Have a seat. <clears throat> so, many of you probably noticed that this week, Cyprus made the news. I wish I could say it was in a positive light, but unfortunately, as the result of an um, act of violence that took place in Larnaca this week, Cyprus, uh, it went viral online, and as a result, millions of people all over the world, you know, again, Cyprus made the news. What happened? Uh, um, long story short, a, a, uh, a woman with a seven-month-old child, went uh, and bought a car from a man. And after she left with the car, the car broke down. And so she took the car back to the man who sold it to her. And that man proceeded, with child in arms, to beat that woman down. And uh, apparently there's quite a few of us who haven't heard the news, who haven't seen it. And it was despicable. There, you, know, you know, everyone, the reaction worldwide was pretty unanimous to see this man beat a woman holding a little child in her arms down to the ground. Uh, you know, we, we respond, the world responds with indignation. 
with you know, just a, a sense of in, injustice and, and disgust. And we collectively ask the question, what kind of person would do this? And this, the, the, the thing is, is that we're tempted to say, well, only the person with the worst kind of human nature would do such a terrible thing. But that isn't actually accurate because it's not the worst kind of human nature. It is simply human nature. It is what we are all capable of in the right circumstances, I'm afraid to say. The collective misery of history stands as evidence that the nature of man is fallen. It is evil very often. And in spite of all of our advances in technology and you know, uh, civilization, all of these things, it is usually just a matter of time before the human heart is exposed for what it truly is. It's only a matter of time before the ugliness of the human heart is revealed. Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds what? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Out of the heart, Jesus said, all of the things that, that make this world miserable find their origin. The source of sin is found in the human heart. That is what Jesus said. That is one of the revelations that he brought through his life and through his ministry. Now, when we say the, the heart, we're not talking about that, that muscle in our chest that pumps blood to uh, all of the different aspects of our body. The heart, in biblical terms, is referring to the core of who we are. It is the seat of our intellect and our mind, our emotions, and, and our personality. And when you and I look at all that is bad in this world, the Bible says it's not a lack of money that causes these things. It's not a lack of land. It's not a lack of, uh, you know, food or, or, or anything else that drives us to do the things we do. It is the lack of righteousness. It is the lack of goodness. It is the lack of uh, love that ultimately is the cause of all of these things. And we have all learned that in spite of all of our attempts to improve uh, our outward appearances, all of our, our, our attempts to tame the human heart and to civilize the human heart have eventually proven to fail. There is a proverb I heard very recently. It's not a biblical proverb, it's just a proverb. And it says, never meet your heroes. Never meet your heroes. And the, the idea behind that proverb is that because it will only lead to disappointment. You know, we have this image of people. You know, whether it's a superstar or a sports figure or an actor or whoever our heroes may be, we will be disappointed if we meet them face to face and spend enough time with them. They will fail to live up to that, you know, lofty expectation that we have of anybody. And that is not only the case individually, but that is the case historically in terms of all of humanity. For all of our great accomplishments. Listen, you and I live in probably one of the most comfortable levels uh, you know, of living that the world has ever known. We live in a modern, civilized, technological world for, uh, to a, a larger degree. 
But even those accomplishments, even those advances that we enjoy today have often come at great cost to others, have often been established and created or built upon the backs of other people. When we look at history, for example, and we see the great civilizations that, that moved civilization forward by our estimate, we discover, if we're honest, that most of them were slave states. They were civilizations that had a huge population of slaves and it was on the backs of those slaves that these advances in civilization were often accomplished. It's the kind of dirty underbelly of history that we don't really like to think about or talk about so much. But that is the reality. When we even think of the incredible advances that we've made in, me in medicine, for example, or technology, the, the, these advances came <clears throat> at an inestimable cost of Dignity, integrity, morality, uh, these incredible you know, lines that we were willing to cross for the greater good. People that were trampled over, lives that are lost, abuses, neglects, all kinds of terrible things, all, again, justified because of the reward. It's worth it. It's a necessary cost that has to be made. All of these things reflect back on the human heart. And the Bible says that if we are ever in this life, in this world, to experience any significant change in the way humanity works, it has to happen at the level of the heart. Proverbs, the Bible Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, NIV version reads this way, Above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Easy to say, but how do we do it? There, you see, there's a problem when it comes to, to dealing with the, the realities, the consequences, the results of what our human hearts have unleashed upon this world. You see, most of the times when we want to deal with a problem, we deal with the symptoms, and often not the cause. At least that is the case when it comes to the human heart. We deal with the symptoms because we don't even know how to deal with the cause. This was and, and continues to be one of the reasons why God introduces the law in the Old Testament. It's one of the reasons that we have so many religions in the world and other self-help programs because we're trying to deal with symptoms. Now, when it comes to the law in the Old Testament, we understand that the law was given by God and the law was designed to show the nation of Israel and the world, ultimately, what sin looks like. And, and perhaps even more importantly, what holiness looks like. Because God is holy and he wants to have fellowship with his people. But there's a sin problem and so he, he has to show them, listen, this is what sin looks like in your life. The law is given to spell out specifically the symptoms of sin, what it looks like in our lives. The law was given to point out uh, what's good and bad, what's clean and unclean, what is holy and what is common. The ultimate result of the law we read in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says, I would not have known sin except through the law. And so, when you and I read something as simple as the Ten Commandments, thou shalt worship no other God before me, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit sexual immorality, thou shalt not steal, bear false witness, take God's name in vain, and so on and so on. All of those things are designed to point out the symptoms of the sickness of the heart. 
and along with countless other laws and commandments, these only point out the symptoms and not the source or don't, don't, don't give a, a remedy to the problem. My wife, Darlene, a couple of years ago, some of you may remember, she fell down some steps and at night, <coughs> excuse me, and tore her Achilles uh, ligament, uh, her tendon, snapped it right in half. Couldn't walk. We went to the doctor's. Now, imagine if the doctor had, you know, said, oh, yes, you've torn your Achilles heel. Uh, my medical advice to you is don't go walking on steps at night anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. We laugh because we think, oh, that's foolishness. It may be true, but uh, you're not dealing with the problem, doc. We need to fix this thing, right? Uh, and again, while, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm going to lose my voice here. <clears throat> So again, while that may be true, it's not very helpful, is it? Because gravity exists. We are going to walk upstairs. People are going to fall. They're going to get injured. You've got to fix the real problem. We would think, what kind of doctor would do this? Just point, you know, point out the, the, the peripheral issue and not get to the core of the problem. And yet, listen, most religious systems and most Self-improvement programs focus on changing behavior. And at the very best, focus on changing our, our minds, perhaps the way we think or whatever. Most religions and self-help programs begin on the basis that you and I are essentially good. That we are essentially good. And their remedy is if, 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 I, if I can just uh, tweak my bad behavior, then I'll be fine. If I can just fix my behavior, then everything will fall into place. We think, in essence, if we can stop being bad, then I'll be good. Or if I stop being sad, then I'll be happy. We're dealing with symptoms. Religion often just deals with symptoms. Self-help programs often just deal with symptoms, changing behavior. And this approach is, in my estimate, the, the big bang theory of human nature. What do I mean by that? Do I promote the big bang theory? Absolutely not. Oh, yes, the entire physical material universe appeared spontaneously from nowhere out of absolutely nothing without any outside intervention. And man, in spite of the legacy of horrors and chaos that history testifies to, is essentially good. I don't believe either of those things. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. If you're here today and you are involved in, you know, you're, you're making an effort to change your behavior, I'm certainly not here to discourage you, amen? If you're doing something, anything in your life that is producing positive results in terms of, you know, behavior-based reforms, then I say, good for you. You know, if it's working for you, stay at it. You know, be strong, carry on. I, I commend you, I, I salute you. If, if you're seeing, you know, results as a, as a, because of your efforts to change your behavior. Uh, psychology, psychiatry, counseling, therapy, support groups, coaching, all of these things can be helpful. They can be useful in our lives. If you're on medication, for a mental problem, take your medication. God bless you. You know, whatever it takes. If you're in rehab, you know, trying to dig your way out of a hole or, or you know, change the way you behave somehow and it's working for you, then, then stick to your program. I'm not here to discourage or, you know, turn anyone away from that. Anything that can give you an advantage 
over the unhealthy appetites and behaviors that we indulge in is helpful. But what if there was something better? What if you could go deeper and experience a change so deep, so profound, so not of our own selves, what if we could find complete transformation? Jesus said, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Notice that of all the things he lists there, they are taken from the Ten Commandments. The commandments of God, the, the holiness of God, is violated by the heart of man. And after 1,000 years of adhering to the law, guess what? The Jews discovered that they were breaking the law as much as they ever had been. Why? Because the law could, not, could only point out the problem. It could not change the problem. Maybe they weren't breaking God's commandments as often or as flagrantly as they would have previously, but the reality was is that they were still breaking the law. Why? Because the law, outward behavioral change, uh, will never reach the heart of man. The law points out sin, but doesn't give the power to live by it. So Jesus gives us this game-changing revelation. It is the heart of man that is the problem. It is the heart that ultimately needs to change. If we're going to see anything radical, anything revolutionary, anything that will turn the world inside out, it's going to happen at the level of the heart. Behavior flows from our nature, not the other way around no matter how much we may want to believe that. And this man that we, many of us watched feeding this woman, you know, maybe he had a mental illness, I don't know. Maybe he grew up in an abusive home, by an abusive father. Maybe he is an alcoholic or had a drinking problem. Or maybe just he's angry, Racist womanizer. It could be that simple. But regardless of why he did what he did, the only way, yeah, you know, we can stick him in prison to try and restrain his what? Behavior. We can stick him into anger management classes and hope that it gives him a measure of control over his temper. But what if we could give him a new heart? What if you and I could get a new heart? Again, we don't deny that outward external circumstances don't have bearing upon a person's behavior. I want to make this point clear. I'm not saying that the home you grew up in or the the culture you were uh, living under or the education you received or the relationships you had throughout your life. I'm not saying that those things don't help to shape the way we behave. They do. We experience trauma that affects the way we behave. We experience loss, neglect, abuse, throughout the years of our lives, and those leave their marks upon us and affect the way we deal with people and interact with our world. But unless we follow that trail of destruction back to the Garden of Eden, we will never get to the heart of the problem, which is the heart of man. I hope you know your Bible, because I'm not getting into detail here, but in Genesis, when our father Adam sinned in the garden, God
God said to him, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And we all know how that went. They ate. They died. And death entered in the moment God was pushed out. Death entered in the moment God was pushed out. You could almost say, almost, that death and sin are the vacuum left behind by the absence of God in our lives. So devastating were those consequences then that the Bible tells us that sin entered into the entire human race. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Bible, the Bible says that every intent in the, of the thoughts, what, of his heart were, was only evil, continually speaking of humanity. Jeremiah the prophet, 17, 9, the heart, listen to this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 12 says, There is none not righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. It's like, hey, what are you trying to tell us here? In just a few verses, four times it says none. And two more times it says, no, not one, just in case you're wondering what none means. No getting out of the implication there, right? Sin's devastating consequence is that every single man, woman, and child who has ever lived on the face of this earth has had a sin problem, has had a dead and broken heart trying to live and interact with the world around them. And so we see the fallout of this reality in our modern civilized world. As we watch bombs fall from the sky, children starving to death in countries, century after century, generation after generation, person after person, cycle after cycle of heartbreak. And it's just an unending loop. Why? Because we're born with it. It's in the heart of man. So just in case I've thoroughly bummed you out... <laughs> This is where the good news comes in, beloved. This is where the good news comes in because God has a plan. God has always had a plan. And that plan is to give us a new heart. Hallelujah. He doesn't want to simply change our behavior. He wants to change our nature. Hallelujah. He wants to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we think or ask. Jesus said, I'm sorry, Paul wrote this. Uh, we read it earlier this morning. Paul prays, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Condensed version here, that he would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's the plan. That Christ, the resurrected, ascended, reigning, triumphant, King of kings and Lord of lords, Son of God, dwells in the hearts of His people. He doesn't, God doesn't want to just change a little bit of our behavior. Maybe we stop cussing so much or stop watching so much Netflix or, you know, spending so much time on the internet or you know maybe we're you know uh trying to treat people a little nicer he wants to go way deeper than that beloved that's all important amen i'm not dismissing any of that but god wants to go so much deeper paul said i'm praying for you guys that god will strengthen you through his holy spirit that jesus christ will dwell in your hearts This is the, the fulfillment of prophecy. You're probably familiar with Ezekiel chapter 11, 
where uh, verse 19, the prophet Ezekiel, speaking on behalf of the Lord God, says, Then I will give them, my people, one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. Why? That they may walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments to do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Notice the flow of that statement. First comes what? A new spirit. God says, I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to give you a new heart. That's the the message of the gospel, by the way. That Jesus came into the world. The Son of God came, lived out his life as a human being, died a sacrificial, substitutionary death on the cross for this forgiveness of sins, rose from the dead victorious uh, uh, with the resurrection, ascended into heaven and poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of that new spirit, that new heart. That is the gospel in its essence. And here the uh, prophet Ezekiel speaking on behalf of the Lord God says, I will give you a new heart. And the result of that new heart is new behavior. I will walk, keep, and do your word and your will and your statutes. And if that's not good enough, we see ultimately the restoration of what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And I will be their God. Hallelujah. That is the gospel in its essence. And it is through this new heart, this new spirit that God gives us, that Christ himself will live out his life in us. Christianity is more than just God making people better. Saving us from our sins And he's transforming us from the inside out. And then using us to reach the lost world around us. God wants to do more than just make us better, make us more obedient people. He wants to, the Bible tells us, to conform us into the image of his son. So this new heart, this new spirit, this new life is, is going to be a, a, a reflection of the life of Christ in and through you and I. The uh, book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 puts it this way. Paul again speaking says, I have been crucified with Christ. Listen, it is no longer, Paul was able to say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. Our lives, the intention here is that as we're born again, what we're talking about here, as we receive the gift of salvation and the the gift of the Holy Spirit, as, as Christ moves into our lives, the idea is that his life and our lives are so intertwined that he is reflected in my behavior. I'm still Tim, you're still you, but there's something about Jesus in all of us. This inward transformation, Christ dwelling in us. Jesus said to His disciples, on the night he was going to the cross, he said, as, I'm sorry, after he rose from the dead, when he had breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus came into the world, what, to preach the gospel, to reach the lost, and he is still doing that through you and I today. Amen? That is our mandate. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus, we're told, went about in his earthly life doing good. 
guess what? He's still doing good through you and I. The Bible says, Jesus said of his, of his people, let your, light, your, let your light so shine among men, what, uh, what? So that they may see your good works and glorify God in heaven. Jesus is still working that out through you and I. Jesus brought grace and mercy, forgiveness. He brought deliverance and freedom to, to the lost, the oppressed, and the sinners during his lifetime. And guess what? He's still doing it today through the church, through the body of Christ, through you and I. People like you and I, through whom he is living out his life. Hallelujah. That's good news because, man, I can't do it. You and I can't do it. All of us together in this room, in our own strength and power, can never do it. But Christ in us, collectively, can do whatever God has called us to do. And this is so central to our faith. Colossians 1.26 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, that's, that's bottom line. That's the, that's, that's the goal. That's the objective. That's God's redemptive purposes for you and I. Nothing short of Christ in us. I like to say it this way, that there is only room for one Christian in my life, and it's not me. <laughs> Jesus. And my responsibility is to let him live his life out in me, to submit to the Holy Spirit, to walk in obedience to his word, to be a part of his people, to live my life for his glory and for his name's sake. But this is where the challenge lies, amen? And this is where we're going to kind of wrap things up this morning. This is where it gets hard. Because it's easy to say, hallelujah, Christ lives in me. Christ dwells in me, but the reality of that is a whole nother thing, because Jesus will tell you to go places you don't want to go. He'll ask you to do things you don't want to do. He'll call you to make sacrifices you don't want to make. He will call you to live a life that is so outside of your comfort zone that we can't even imagine. And so we have the prayer here in front of us this morning that Paul prayed. That God, and this is my prayer for you, and I'm asking you to keep praying this for me, that God would strengthen us with power through the inner man. That Christ will dwell in our hearts by faith. We need to be praying for ourselves and for each other. The same thing that John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase and imagine if we were praying that every day imagine if we got out of our beds every morning saying that prayer over our lives Lord today less of me more of you Lord today less of me more of you imagine do you think God's going to answer that prayer Amen, he's going to answer that prayer. Imagine what that would do to our marriages. Imagine what that will do to our families. The changes, talk about behavioral changes. Imagine what that will do to our neighbors, to our work atmosphere. More of you, Lord. Less of me. Maybe if that was our prayer and that was the determination of our heart, Cyprus would make the news in a completely different way. God can do it, beloved. He will do it if we let him. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Be thankful, so thankful for your faith.